<clears throat> so yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in for the talk today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, multi-agent perspective to artificial intelligence. And uh, briefly, I would be uh, talking about uh, three major topics on uh, uh, in this talk, like uh, what's the motivation for using uh, multiple agents for uh, coming up with a with a general AI system. Uh, uh, we will look into one of the one of uh, one of the problems which comes together with it in more detail, and you know, a nice solution which was one of my previous works. And finally, uh, I will get to present some of the discussions which I've had with good AI team in trying to, you know, conjure such a such a AI which uses multiple agents. So yeah, that would be more of a topic for, uh, you know, which is open to discussion and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a great discussion around it. So yeah, with, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, let's start the talk. So uh, basically, uh, let's first look at the, the most uh, uh, simple thing to do about uh, any, any kind of research, which is uh, basically finding out what is exactly a multi-agent system. So Wikipedia says that a multi-agent system is basically a computerized system composed of multiple interacting agents. And uh, yeah, the, the idea is that these, these agents together can solve problems which are otherwise difficult for an individual agent or a monolithic system to solve. So I think the key takeaway for, uh, for, from this definition is the mono, monolithic system, because uh, uh, basically, uh, usually when we think of multi-agent systems, the thing which comes to our mind is, you know, like it's a separate entities trying to solve a problem. But um, uh, actually, uh, more often than not, um, it's the case that uh, any kind of problem requires uh, an inherent sort of like distribution or like, you know, decentralization, which is required for solving the task. And uh, later in the talk, we'll see uh, why exactly is this the case and, uh, you know, what are the challenges which come to, uh, come to, uh, to the front as we do that. So, yeah, so just bear in mind that I think the monolithic system is the most important, uh, you know, thing which you want to counter as a multi-agent system. So uh, multi-agent systems are uh, definitely a natural way of organization. Uh, you see, uh, uh, you see them, you know, nicely factorizing your tasks across, uh, you know, various uh, levels of difficulty, be it the action space or the state space. They also give a very nice way to localize your problems into, uh, you know, something which can be solved uh, in a in a very nearly optimal way uh, for for different uh, parts of your problem space, and they offer very nice. So sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'm not sure if you're sharing the right screen. Right now, we can still see only the the PDF of the first page of your slides. Right. So let's check this. Okay. Now we can see page two. Oh, I guess. Uh, I guess the thing is. Uh, I need to share the screen uh, rather than the application because. We can see the mouse move now. <coughs> Sorry, what? We can see your mouse moving, so it should be okay. Right, so let me just go to the full screen mode if it still works. Can you, can you still see the screen? I just went to full screen mode. Yeah. Yes, now, now, now we can see the full screen. It's, it seems right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry for the small fiasco. Uh, um, yeah, so hopefully you still uh, follow the discussion about the multi-agent system definition. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I was talking about the motivation, um, uh, so multi-agent systems are a natural way of organization. They provide us with uh, things like, you know, factorization of the problem, um, uh, means to approximate the problem locally and uh, they're definitely very modular because uh, you know you can add a lot of agents together into a system and uh, uh, they can increase the capacity of your uh, team to solve a particular problem. Of course uh, uh, multi-agent systems are biologically inspired. Uh, you see several examples of uh, you know different organisms coming together to solve some some of the big, very big challenges uh, be it uh, like ant colonies trying to construct something or be it humans trying to make something um, uh, you know meaningful uh, uh, out of their efforts so so definitely multi-agent systems are quite ubiquitous in the nature 
the third and most important thing about multi-agent systems is their flexibility uh, because, um, you know, different agents which are coming into the system, they offer multiple ways of learning and coordination amongst themselves. And uh, I think that's very important because uh, depending on the task, you always want to have this capacity to, uh, you know, uh, uh, coordinate on the go and like uh, basically establish uh, some some uh, nice optimal behavior for uh, for your uh, for your for your problem. Um, the next uh, good thing about multi agent systems uh, is basically its scalability because uh, uh, essentially doing everything in a centralized manner comes up with a lot of cost um, and that, that cost is uh, basically computational intractability. And I think uh, because of this, um, you know, uh, Swarm AI or like multi-agent AI might might be the only feasible um, artificial general intelligence because uh, essentially without breaking down the problem, I think it would be too difficult to solve any kind of, uh, you know, realistic scenario uh, or make uh, breakthroughs in the domain of intelligence. So uh, multi-agent systems are already seeing a lot of applications, uh, uh, which are very nice. Uh, you must have seen them in Swarm Robotics, uh, in autonomous cars, which are trying to coordinate, uh, or in, even in finance industry. So it's definitely very versatile in terms of application. Uh, just a side check, you're still seeing the screens, right? Uh, great. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so uh, given given this motivation, uh, there are very interesting directions uh, which pop up uh, when you discuss uh, multi-agent systems, and uh, I have tried my best to capture most of the aspects uh, uh, about multi-agent systems, which is very appealing to a researcher. Um, and here's seven of them. Of course, this list might not be complete, and uh, yeah, of course, we can discuss more uh, as we as we go into the discussion phase. So I think the first problem which comes is um, is that of exploration. So if you guys are familiar with the concept of exploration in a single agent system, uh, then that problem becomes uh, uh, as uh, just as more difficult uh, as the number of agents increase because uh, essentially exploration um, in in some form would be like decentralized for a multi agent system and to coordinate uh, a behavior which uh, which can you know allow allow the agents to systematically explore the action space or the state space uh, becomes that much more difficult or to gain you know like uh, a meaningful uh, inferences from the environment becomes that much more difficult so exploration in multi agent systems is a, is a very difficult problem and in fact uh, i'll be getting into more details about recent work of mine about how exploration and learning are kind of related to each other. Um, the, next, uh, the next difficult thing about uh, multi agent systems is uh, that the problem of you know, coordination. So uh, this could be a coordination uh, which is you know, reactive to the environment uh, as the environment changes. And uh, once again, that's a tenet of multi agent systems uh, because of uh, the flexibility which we expect from them. We want them to be you know, very flexible and adaptive to changes in the environment and uh, you know, form, uh, uh, form uh, different theme specializations. Uh, or like coordinate properly on the go to solve the particular task. The third challenging uh, uh, topic uh, pertaining to multi-agent systems is that of communication and decentralization. So basically, uh, any form of multi-agent system uh, would either have to be completely decentralized, as in the agents would uh, not uh, interact with each other through messages at all, in which case it becomes uh, very difficult for them to know what is happening with the other agents, and they would have to totally rely on some form of uh, reasoning uh, based on inference of their observations. Or they could have some, uh, some uh, little amount of communication between each other, um, to uh, tell others about this, their own state or uh, you know th their plans about solving a particular problem. So uh, yeah, communication is uh, is what brings uh, you know like uh, the continuity to the spectrum of centralized control versus decentralized control because depending on the amount of communication, uh, you you get a very nice mix uh, uh, at uh, towards different points at the spectrum. Um, the fourth problem is of course that of learning because. Uh, as soon as you cast a problem as a multi-agent system or uh, if you're trying to solve any big uh, realistic uh, 
uh, task, the the state and action space might might be you know uh, very large. Uh, in fact, it's exponential in the number of agents for a multi-agent system, and so we have to come up with uh, a very clever means of approximating the associated quantities uh, for our solution. Uh, they could be uh, you know the value functions or the policies and so on. Um, the fifth point, which I mentioned earlier briefly before, was the, that of reasoning and inference. So uh, basically, uh, since there is some form of decentralization always present in a multi-agent system, the, the agents have to come up with methods to reason about other agents and uh, infer their states and you know, try to communicate with them either through their actions uh, in a passive manner or actively communicate uh, through you know, a communication channel. Um, the sixth point in our list is basically uh, specialization and role learning. So uh, whenever we say multi-agent systems, uh, uh, we immediately think of, you know, these uh, big entities which have uh, uh, agents which, uh, which are specialized in some manner, you know, like uh, it might be, uh, uh, you know, in, in case of humans, uh, a very simple example could be that of a football, uh, a football team, you know, in which there are players playing for defense, the player playing attack, and there's a goalkeeper and so on. Um, uh, and even, of course, in, in the animal kingdom, you know, when there are like different, uh, within the same species of ants, there are like sp uh, different units which are responsible for different tasks. And finally, there are very interesting questions which, um, uh, which came theory can uh, tell us uh, from a multi-agent perspective, you know, about the uh, attainability of certain kinds of equilibrium behaviors in a competitive scenario, or for, uh, you know, like uh, even in the case of cooperative scenarios where you could somehow cast the problem as a competitive setting, uh, you know, analyzing the behavior of the uh, agents in the, in the asymptote. So with that, I would like to discuss a recent work of mine uh, called Multi-Agent Variation Exploration, which basically uh, is about the problem of exploration and learning um, and how they interact together in a multi-agent system. So uh, this paper uh, was featured in NeurIPS last year. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, essentially the setting which we are talking about in this paper is that of corporate and multi-agent reinforcement learning. Now, multi-agent systems can be trained in multiple ways, uh, like reinforcement learning or evolution. So in this particular paper, we are focusing on reinforcement learning. And uh, the setting, uh, uh, more specifically, is that of centralized training and decentralized execution. So basically, um, the agents uh, in our setting are trained in a, in a control environment where they have access to the states of each other, either through a centralized entity or you know, they can communicate. But during the execution time, they have no uh, access to the states of other agents. Uh, they just uh, can observe them uh, if they are within the, you know, the observations. Uh, range. Uh, otherwise, they have to be, you know, like completely reliant on their own, uh, on their own reasoning about the other agents. So, yeah, as I mentioned before, the key challenges for the setting are basically, uh, you know, you need to be scalable because of the exponential state action space blow up, and uh, the the fact that it's a decentralized execution scenario. So uh, I, uh, in, in my paper, I basically uh, used the uh, framework of a, a PalmDB, a decentralized PalmDB to model the problem in which uh, we have states, uh, so state spaces, action spaces, uh, observation functions, and uh, essentially the probability kernel. And uh, uh, we denote uh, the action space for each of the agents using the, uh, using the trajectory tau. So uh, I would I would not spend too much time in the in the theoretical form formulations because uh, you can always refer back to the paper and uh, uh, clarify. So basically, uh, uh, in in our in our scenario in our setting, the the problem is that of finding the optimal uh, value function. So uh, what it means is uh, uh, essentially the expected value of uh, the sum of discounted rewards. So here, uh, gamma is a discounting factor, and R is the reward which you get at each time step, given your uh, current state ST and the joint action UT. And uh, yeah, so basically associated with every, uh, uh, every optimal uh, action value function is also a corresponding policy pi star. So, you know, so uh, these two problems are sort of like the same. Uh, if you solve one, you, you kind of get the other. So, uh, yeah, so our goal is to essentially find an optimal policy for the agents to act in the environment. 
And uh, yeah, here in figure one, you can see a very simple example of a multi-agent scenario uh, for the game of StarCraft, in which, you know, one of the team consists of two, uh, two agents trying to, you know, defeat the other one uh, lying across the bridge. Uh, uh, so, so yeah. Uh, in in this case, uh, each of the agents is like uh, each of the unit is treated as an independent agent. So a core concept of uh, uh, CTDE uh, algorithms is uh, that of decentralizability, which assumes that uh, you know there exists uh, there exists uh, you know like uh, utility functions, which can be such that uh, the uh, the maximization problem of the joint action value function over uh, the joint action space, which is exponential in the number of agents, can be uh, solved uh, through uh, local maximization, uh, which is basically taking an argmax over each of the individual agent utilities. So, uh, so this is basically decentralizable argmax. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the operation on the left-hand side is essentially that of an exponential nature in the number of agents, whereas uh, that on the line uh, on the left -hand, uh, on the right-hand side is essentially a linear operation across the number of uh, in the number of agents. So that's like a very big gain, and uh, you know that's like one of the main reasons why you resort to decentralizability because it uh, indirectly gives you computational tractability for your problems. So here's a is a nice Venn diagram of uh, you know the classification of uh, various kinds of scenarios which can happen in a multi-agent problem, and uh, we will we'll get into details about this feature uh, more in the talk. There have been several existing uh, algorithms and methods which have been proposed to solve this uh, centralized training decentralized execution problem. And can I ask a very short question about the previous slide? Yeah, sure. Sorry. So uh, in the previous slide, you assume that the agents see the whole state of all the, all the agents. So the S is the same for each of the Q1 to Qn? Yeah, that's right. Okay. But uh, similar extensions can exist for uh, the partially observable settings. So uh, yeah, okay. Th that's a great question. Thanks. <clears throat> Right, so uh, as I was saying, uh, there have been multiple methods uh, previously which try to attain this uh, decentralizable uh, argmax, uh, which we discussed before. Uh, and typically uh, they do so by coming up with constraints over the class of the, the action value functions which they learn. So works like QMix um, and BDN, value decomposition networks, uh, they try to use uh, certain uh, constraints on the value functions. For QMix, it's just the partial derivative of the, uh, of the uh, you know, individual utilities, of the total uh, joint uh, action values with respect to individual utilities, which is ensured to be positive. Uh, VDN is even more constraining in the sense that, uh, you know, they model the joint action values just as sum of utilities across the agents. So uh, uh, as you can see, once you, uh, you know, like uh, make the hypothesis class of your action values smaller and smaller, it becomes easier to learn in the multi-agent problem. And this is what uh, precisely these algorithms uh, try to achieve. Um, there are, however, other works like Qtran, which uh, sort of pose the decentralization problem as optimization. Uh, however, they have to uh, include uh, an exponential number of constraints in the problem to solve it uh, exactly, uh, which is, again, computationally intractable. So they resort to, you know, like some relaxation schemes. And uh, yeah, there are some very simple approaches which completely ignore the multi-agent problem, like that of independent queue learning, uh, and they approximate the whole problem as that of independent, you know, single-agent problem. Uh, although this problem has a caveat that it uh, it is susceptible to non-stationary uh, non-stationary effects in the uh, underlying MDP. So, uh, given these uh, problems. Uh, given these uh, solutions to the to the CTD problem, the th uh, the thing which I noted down was uh, that uh, in some sense these problems kind of uh, you know ignored the problem of exploration, and uh, I proved that you know if they uh, given given their uh, solution approaches, they are always susceptible to suboptimality because uh, the way they have defined their hypothesis class. Uh, they can always interfere with the uh, with the exploration process of the agents, uh, and uh, that would mean that you know it's not always the case that the agents would learn the optimal behavior, and uh, we'll see this in greater details in terms of you know the theorems which I came up with. But the key idea is like uh, basically you know imposing structural constraints on the hypothesis uh, learned can induce suboptimality through exploration. 
um, because it interferes with the exploration process. And the, the, the reason I found out for this, uh, this uh, peculiar problem was, uh, was that of something which I call non-monotonicity, which we'll see uh, quickly uh, in, in some time. So basically, uh, the idea for uh, Maven was to use the latent space to address uh, you know, this uh, non-monotonicity non problem. You know, and Maven uh, essentially uses the latent space to come up with uh, multiple hypotheses for solving the problem. Uh, so it approximates the given non-monotonic problem in, in multiple uh, uh, monotonic approximations. And uh, a cool side effect of this is, uh, you know, we also, uh, you know, can show some form of committed exploration uh, as a bonus to our agents. Committed exploration is, uh, an, is an important aspect uh, for solving reinforcement learning problems because typically, uh, you know, any kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, exploration would have a, have a nature of, you know, long-term or like uh, long-termness or like uh, the, the aspect that, you know, you commit to a particular kind of behavior for a very long time to see how it turns out. Uh, and so I think it's very important to develop those kind of methods as well. So uh, as I, I was talking before, uh, the problem of non-monotonicity is uh, sim uh, very simply explained with this uh, uh, essentially two agent problem in which uh, in figure A, we have essentially two agents with three actions, A, B, and C, uh, playing a game, uh, uh, playing a one-step matrix game. Uh, and essentially uh, the rewards here are given by the joint actions. So um, let's, we can call one of the agents as the, as the row agent, and the other one as the column agent. And uh, the problem of, uh, uh, of the matrix game is to maximize the rewards, which is jointly obtained by the, the two agents. So as you can see in figure A, the, the optimal reward is that, uh, which uh, comes when the agents jointly take the action A comma A, and that's 10.4. Uh, whereas uh, there are other uh, suboptimal rewards of, uh, for example, 10 and zero in the, in the grid as well. So uh, what Humix, uh, which was the, the state of the art at the time of publishing Maven, uh, learns is uh, shown in B here. And as you can see, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite far away from the, from the actual value function or the actual utilities. Uh, as uh, according to Qmix, the optimal function is uh, C comma C here. Uh, the optimal action is C comma C here. Uh, whereas it puts very little uh, you know, credit to the joint action, which is actually the optimal in the, in the problem. So uh, this is this basically the problem of uh, you know non-monotonicity, and uh, the essence of the non-monotonicity lies in the fact that uh, given the action, uh, given the uh, like the problem of maximizing my joint utility is basically dependent on the actions of the other agents. So when I fix the uh, the column agent's action to be A then my maximizing action is A. But if I fix the maximum, uh, if the action of the, uh, of the column agent to be B, then essentially uh, my maximizing actions are either B or C. And uh, this is like the simplest uh, manifestation of non-monotonicity. And uh, in general, uh, non-monotonicity can be captured uh, using this definition here, uh, which you know, covers every kind of case possible uh, based on you know, this uh, conditioning property, which I uh, uh, previously mentioned. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very uh, big definition, but uh, I hope uh, the, the, the rigorous people will find it useful uh, if they want to look at it. So given this non-monotonicity, uh, I basically proved a very interesting result uh, about QMix uh, for different cases of exploration, exploration behavior. So the first result is about something called uniform visitation, uh, which is, you know, uh, it's just like uh, visiting each and every action uniformly, uh, as uniformly as possible. And so uh, in this result, uh, essentially, if your uh, metrics payoff or tensor payoffs look like that in, uh, in the figure here, uh, then you're guaranteed to be like at least uh, delta suboptimal in, in you know, the, the policy which you learn in the SN dot. So this result is uh, very important uh, because uh, it basically shows that however much experience you gain from the environment, given that your hypothesis space itself is constrained, you can never learn the optimal policy. And uh, that's a big deal because uh, the difference between the optimal policy and the suboptimal policy closest after that could be big in, uh, you know, like many different environments. And uh, it could lead to a lot of problems in terms of, you know, the agent behaving, uh, not behaving properly. 
A similar results also exist for uh, the epsilon greedy visitation, which is uh, the usual practice for uh, uh, you know these uh, queue lining approaches. And uh, there also uh, uh, we can show a result, uh, which is once again uh, almost uh, uh, almost just as bad as the uniform visitation case, uh, in which uh, you uh, you can fail to find the optimal policy with uh, with a uh, with a finite probability. Now the fix I propose for this in my paper is essentially uh, uh, that of using a latent policy to condition your networks. And this recipe is kind of uh, generic in the sense that you can use it with any other kind of existing uh, multi-agent uh, algorithm. So uh, Maven essentially uh, introduces a latent policy which is transformed to get uh, a latent variable Z here. And that Z is used to condition uh, something called a HackmanNet map or uh, which is a fancy term for you know changing the the weights of your of the top top network of your top, top layer of your utility networks, and uh, uh, this essentially helps you to get like different uh, utility values for uh, different values of the the latent variable z here. And uh, one more uh, one more component which Maven has is essentially that of uh, the uh, the mutual information unit, which ensures that you know you learn different sort of joint behaviors for the different agents uh, given the given the latent variables value. So the idea is that uh, of making the 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 behavior the joint behavior of the agents as diverse as possible over uh, long duration of time steps. Uh, in, in our case, it's uh, essentially the whole episode for, for training. Uh, I, I shall now describe uh, briefly the, the losses which are, which are used for training, the, uh, for training Maven. Uh, and essentially, there are three kinds of losses which I consider. So uh, the first of them is obtained by you know, fixing the, the latent variable, and uh, that is basically your queue learning loss. So as soon as you fix the value of your latent variable, your utilities get a certain meaning, uh, depending on the HappyNet map. And uh, essentially, the problem becomes that of queue learning. So you just try to learn the joint utility, utilities here. Seeing back our figure here, uh, uh, there's another policy you have to learn and that is uh, that is what I call the hier hierarchical policy here uh, over the latent variable itself and uh, in Maven we train it using uh, basically policy gradient methods but you can choose any any of your favorite algorithms for this case and the third loss is that uh, coming from the mutual information uh, uh, you know unit which is uh, also which can also be seen as a discriminatory loss. So this this loss is interesting because essentially it encourages diverse behavior uh, uh, amongst the agents, as I was talking before. So essentially, the the, the principle of mutual information here is used to maximize uh, uh, the the entropy, uh, the conditional entropy of the of the agents, uh, given the value of the latent variable. So uh, uh, as, you, as you can see in equation five, if uh, the entropy of the, of the trajectories uh, here is maximized given uh, uh, between the trajectories and the, and the latent variables maximized, essentially what that gives us is a notion of identifiability, uh, meaning that uh, you know, given a particular value of latent variable, you can, uh, you can pinpoint what the joint behavior of the agent is like, you know, and it has some very nice semantics uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the agents are moving a certain direction, for example, in in a particular, uh, you know, physical world, or it could be some some very nice semantic interpretation uh, for other kind of problems. And uh, yeah, so um, as as this this entity in equation five is quite interactable for you know uh, any kind of uh, non uh, non generic distribution. Uh, uh, any kind of generic distribution. So basically, we introduce a lower bound for maximizing this uh, using the Jensen uh, inequality. And the overall objective then becomes like a combination of these three losses, which are individually trained in phases. So we have some interesting experiments uh, on the toy domain to, you know, like uh, uh, basically like uh, give proof of concept and also on the domain of StarCraft 2. Uh, which is a bit more realistic, uh, arguably. 
So, uh, so we have got uh, something called the uh, M-step matrix schemes, uh, which are designed for this problem. Essentially, M-step matrix scheme is uh, a continued matrix scheme over multiple time steps, uh, uh, M being the parameter which decides the number of time steps. And uh, the, the key uh, characteristic of this game is that the initial step is uh, non-monotonic. So as you can see in figure A, uh, there are essentially uh, two ways or like two kind of like, uh, you know, monotonicities in the in the first reward payoff, which is like, you know, given the row action, uh, given the column action as uh, the first one, then the row action should be uh, the first one here and the column action as the second one, then the maximizing uh, uh, row action should also be two and vice versa. So essentially there are like two ways to go about this game. And uh, only one of these branches, uh, as you take them iteratively over different steps, uh, leads you to the optimal reward. So in this case, it's the left branch here, which ultimately gives you a reward of four. Uh, and so the optimal reward of this game is basically M plus three um, uh, for any uh, M steps. So as you increase the number M, you basically make the exploration harder and harder. So uh, it will be more difficult for agents to find out this optimal payoff, uh, ultimate payoff of four. So as you can see in this plot, uh, I compared Maven and Qmix. And uh, while Maven can quickly, you know, associate itself to the optimal behavior of choosing the left branch, Qmix kind of struggles a lot with, uh, with a great amount of variance to, to learn that the optimal function actually, uh, the optimal action lies towards taking the left branch uh, iteratively. We see some very interesting results in the StarCraft domain also. Uh, so the StarCraft multi-agent challenge uh, is a wrapper around the StarCraft domain, which allows us to train multi-agent systems in a centralized uh, execution, decentralized, uh, sorry, centralized training, decentralized execution manner. And uh, here I show the results on uh, two super hard uh, maps in StarCraft, which, uh, you know, Maven gives a much better performance on uh, as compared to other algorithms like uh, Coma, IQL, QMA, and Qtran. Uh, essentially, uh, they, uh, we also tested on uh, other kind of uh, new maps in StarCraft, which, uh, which, are, uh, which are explicitly made for uh, the exploration. And in this map, uh, which I call Zlot-K, we essentially have a tree structure, which uh, you know, increases, as, as you increase the depth of the tree, uh, you have to uh, explore more and more number of uh, uh, you know states, and the problem is to find the the leaf node here, uh, which uh, which is always present you know in a particular branch here, uh, and as you increase the depth, the exploration problem becomes very hard. Uh, so once again, in this problem, uh, I tested uh, Maven against other algorithms for different depths, and we found that uh, you know Maven outperforms the other algorithms very nicely because it can associate uh, all these paths which go from the root to the to the leaf nodes uh, with uh, different uh, you know, latent variables, and that uh, helps it overcome the problem of exploration. Uh, uh, one thing which I forgot to mention before was that um, the, the the bounds which are which I obtained for QMix they can also be obtainable for other algorithms like uh, VDN and so on. Uh, so yeah, that's a good thing to note because uh, it's not a problem with specifically with QMix, but with any kind of algorithm which uh, you know puts puts these constraints. So uh, yeah, so we also got into one interesting experiment about uh, testing out Maven for robustness. So essentially in this experiment, what happens is uh, yeah, we have like a simple scenario called two corridor in which there's a team of two agents which is trying to go over the bridge and defeat this uh, other stalker guy on the other end of the bridge. And uh, uh, what happens is uh, as, you, as you train the agents, midway through the training, we close this short corridor. So there are two corridors to reach the enemy. Uh, and when you, when you close the short corridor, the algorithm has to adopt and uh, you know, use the longer corridor. So the way we have set up this game is you get like a greater reward when you use the short corridor. And uh, yeah, so typically what algorithms, uh, be, uh, be, uh, the way algorithms behave is uh, that they, they find this uh, short corridor uh, policy and then uh, as soon as we close the corridor, they just, you know, like they are just confused and they can never find the longer corridor because, you know, they are stuck with this uh, uh, hypothesis of uh, thinking that, you know, this is the only way to go here. 
Uh, whereas uh, Maven, since it has this latent variable, which nicely you know allows it to associate different long-term behaviors with uh, different values of the latent variable, it uh, not only finds the other long corridor way, but uh, when the short corridor is no longer present, it uh, very smoothly you know starts using the longer corridor to solve the problem. So uh, that demonstrates that you know there's a very nice uh, robustness, which uh, which is an added side effect which you get from uh, you know using this latent space. Uh, uh, the final good thing about Maven, uh, which we found out, was that it was um, having a very nice, uh, you know, impact on the representability of the system overall. So here we have a T-SNE plot of uh, basically uh, the the initial state, uh, which is labeled with the different uh, latent variables that la uh, Maven associates. So uh, as the as the training proceeds from uh, left to the right hand side of the of the plot here. Uh, you can see that uh, initially uh, all of these states are, uh, you know, tagged with uh, random colors. So each color here is a value of the latent variable. But as the training proceeds, uh, you can see this nice, you know, like clustering of the different initial states with the uh, latent variables, suggesting that Maven is trying to come up with, you know, local approximations for all of these states, uh, you know, uh, with the different values of C. So that's, uh, again, you know, one of the good things which I was initially talking about in my, uh, you know, interesting directions for the multi agent learning. So, uh, yeah, so uh, given given the work, uh, I definitely have some more interesting future work to follow up. Uh, and uh, that is basically centered around, you know, finding out convergence uh, properties and completeness properties for Maven, uh, doing some sort of optimality analysis for, uh, you know, uh, other games. Uh, than the, this, the stateless, stateless ones, uh, and you know, uh, carrying out experiments for continuous latent space. Uh, so, so that was the you know just the gist of uh, you know the, uh, one of the difficulties which comes with training a multi-agent systems and how we can cleverly you know overcome the difficulty. Uh, uh, now, essentially, I would like to, uh, you know, direct your attention towards a more open-ended question, uh, and uh, this is basically uh, coming out from some of the discussions which I had with uh, Team Good AI. Um, so uh, we we had some previous meetings, and uh, we were trying to tackle a very interesting question, and uh, that was uh, basically, you know, uh, the question of whether Badger is a multi-agent system or not. So uh, uh, after our talks, we actually came up with uh, an initial proposition of uh, you know a multi-agent take on Badger, and uh, that essentially looks like this fancy picture over here. And uh, this picture is just you know uh, an initial attempt, or uh, as you might say, you know thinking out loud towards uh, getting all of the the, the, uh, the important properties which I mentioned before that a multi-agent system should have. And uh, and uh, given in light of you know how and why a uh, multi-agent system is likely going to be the candidate for ATI, so so yeah, that's that's an attempt of joining the the multi-agent perspective with uh, what you guys have been doing with Badger, um, and essentially uh, my design here consists of uh, six different units, uh, which I'll briefly be talking about uh, uh, in the later slides. And uh, you can essentially think of uh, our Badger agent as essentially like, uh, you know, nature itself, uh, as I think uh, in one of the discussions with Marek, uh, we concluded, you know, because uh, all of these experts can be, can be thought of like, you know, as org organisms which are trying to evolve and like uh, essentially uh, we, uh, they are they are uh, getting ex uh, becoming experts in their own unique things, but their ultimate goal is to you know somehow live uh, in the, in a more perfect way in the environment, uh, which is grounded by the physics of the world. So uh, the core components of the of the our multi agent take on Badger is essentially uh, you know th there are six core components. Uh, the resource manager, which is like a centralized overlooker, which allocates budget for compute. Uh, or other kind of resources to the experts. Uh, there's a processor which uh, essentially translates different observations uh, and gives rise to a shared latent space or a, a representation space, which the ag agents can use for uh, coming up with policies. Uh, there's also a forward model because I, I think that you know any kind of uh, generally intelligent system would in fact have some form of like forward model to predict and you know like uh, uh, the transitions and the rewards in the system. Although this is not a necessity, but I think uh, I, I'm, I'm slightly inclined to think that you know any any such system would have a forward model to predict things. 
um, uh, there's an expert pool, which we all know is like, uh, you know, uh, the experts which are trying to specialize in different things. Uh, apart from the expert pool, there's a communication unit which uh, allows to, the different ag agents or experts to, uh, you know, essentially share their expertise and coordinate amongst each other. And finally, there's a diversified unit which is responsible for, you know, making all of these experts as diverse as possible and, you know, specialize in different aspects. So, uh, Basically, uh, the idea of having such a design is to uh, ensure multiple things. The first of them is that of uh, knowledge transfer. So basically, uh, we want agents to be able to utilize uh, the, the samples from the environment which they get uh, uh, to a maximum extent possible and uh, you know, extract the knowledge and share it with the other agents to uh, come up with better generalization. So in our design, uh, essentially knowledge transfer is facilitated by three things. Uh, the processor, which is translating different, uh, you know, task observations onto a sh uh, same representation space or uh, same shared space. Uh, the second level of uh, uh, knowledge transfer happens through expert communication. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the expert can share their internal states uh, to better inform the other agents about a particular, particular task. And uh, finally, uh, we can, of course, share the parameters across the experts, uh, and that will also result in generalization. The second thing is uh, essentially uh, the role of the processor because uh, it, it, it has a lot of job here in this design because uh, you know, it's, it's augmenting the shared space with important environmental attributes, uh, like you know, the dimensionality of the environment or the layout of the environment if it's like a physical world. And uh, this might be, uh, and we hope that this can be learned in an unsupervised manner because uh, you know, that's essentially what humans also do. Uh, uh, they can they can have like uh, very different tasks in which they operate on and they somehow you know use a, a shared space in the in their minds to come up with the solutions finally uh, uh, the, the the resource manager you know it acts like a centralized unit for uh, uh, basically allocating the compute time and other resources to the experts and uh, uh, you know it also controls how much communication is allowed you know and uh, that's how it uh, offers a spectrum for centralized versus totally decentralized control so what I would like to think about the dynamics of this design is essentially it works in two phases. There's like a thinking phase uh, and there's a doing phase. So essentially in the thinking phase, the experts, they, they use the budget allocated by the resource manager, uh, uh, or which is essentially a policy, you know, to compute uh, the actions over time period. And uh, once they, they do their computation about, you know, the goodness of a particular action to take given the problem, uh, they, they then can, you know, like uh, come up with a, you know, consensus on what to do in that given, uh, in that given situation. They also use intrinsic rewards, which are facilitated by, by the diversifier and the, you know, trajectory estimates uh, of the forward model to optimize their performance. So once the thinking phase is finished, uh, we go to the doing phase in which the experts communicate their actions or intents. And uh, essentially the elected policy uh, then chooses, uh, you know, one particular action uh, to, to act out. So as, uh, as you might have noticed, you know, we are essentially utilizing the multi-agentness at the expert level here. And uh, of course, that means that uh, we can use many of the existing algorithms which have been found out to, you know, test out how, how these different components work together and uh, use essentially those algorithms to train out these modules which I've listed here. Uh, the other interesting topic, uh, the other interesting point about this design is, uh, you know, essentially the experts compete at the level of the resource manager because, you know, uh, the more amount of resources which you are allocated to the resource manager, the better you get at the particular, you know, task which you're trying to specialize in. So it's like, a, you know, a, a, almost a zero sum game from the perspective of a resource manager. Uh, whereas from the uh, from the viewpoint of an environment, the experts are essentially cooperating with each other because uh, you know they are trying to maximize this external reward, uh, uh, which you can which they can get from the environment. And so uh, it's again one one of the very nice dual views which you can get to this problem. And you know there are some very nice insights which you can explore uh, for uh, theoretical analysis as well as practical algorithms. 
And a uh, few, few more key points, which are basically that the Ford model, uh, you know, it, it helps to plan and simulate the, and evaluate the experts. Uh, as I mentioned before, it, it also has, you know, options to uh, inform the diversification in it to give intrinsic rewards. Uh, uh, the diversifier uh, as its role is to keep the, uh, the agents as diverse as possible, you know, with respect to their attributes uh, and, uh, you know, make them specialized to certain tasks uh, or a pool of tasks. Uh, and then finally, you know, communication, which is one, one, one of the things which you again discussed before as an essential for a multi-agent system. And the communications role is basically to ensure like scalability and parallelism, uh, and it avoids any kind of centralized bottlenecks, which we typically see in a single agent system. So uh, I think that uh, Badger is a multi-agent system at the end, because uh, I think any kind of ATI would need to have these kind of approximations for solving a big problem. And uh, I think a design which is similar to this would definitely enable it to you know, come up with the approximations uh, and uh, the solutions in the right way uh, to closely you know, uh, solve a particular challenging task in the real world. Um, of course, uh, uh, our design is also offering, uh, you know, multiple attributes, you know, it's, uh, it's very versatile in terms of uh, uh, different aspects, uh, which are definitely a good thing to have because, you know, you can train your, or you can tune your uh, uh, setup in such a way as to get the maximum performance. And uh, yeah, here we have a lot of choices with respect to the learning algorithms for the agents. So as I mentioned before, you have options to use reinforcement learning, you have options to use some form of evolutionary approach, uh, whatever it be uh, your your uh, favorite flavor of training. Uh, you have a lot of choice for the model class as well. So uh, as we saw, there was like a Ford model for, uh, for our agents. And uh, essentially there are some very cool uh, uh, ideas for using uh, different, you know, like models for uh, uh, modeling the environment. Uh, the third thing which is under our control is the hierarchy of the agents. So as typically, you know, human experts also tend to have a hierarchy in the in the in their organizations you know like essentially like a company uh, we can also have this kind of structure amongst the experts themselves to basically abstract away uh, you know ideas at different levels and operate at different levels there's also this aspect of intrinsic motivation which can be defined in multiple different ways you know like uh, some of the agents could be totally explorative in which they are trying to you know explore the state action space as much as they want to others could have somewhat uh, more uh, complicated uh, you know like intrinsic motivation patterns in which uh, the intrinsic motivation is dependent on uh, some other aspects of the observation observations like you know the rewards or something else there's also a lot of freedom for communication protocols, which is again, an interesting thing to try out. Uh, you can have some fixed form of communication between the agents initially, or you could even learn uh, them from scratch. And finally, uh, the processor, which was allowing like a common representation uh, is also like uh, fundamentally rich with uh, multiple choices uh, for, the, for the knowledge base and you know, different, uh, different aspects and features which need to be embedded inside for every expert to uh, basically function properly. So uh, with that, I would like to end my, end my talk. And uh, uh, I thank you once again for listening in uh, about the multi-agent perspective to AI. Um, and uh, yeah, I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, and you can also reach me out at the email uh, mentioned here. Thanks. Thank you very much.